Welcome back to the Mojo Podcast, and I hope you're going well. It feels like there's a lot on our collective minds right now, especially with the war in Ukraine. And if you're in Europe, that feels very close to home. When there is a lot to concern us, my advice, as during peak COVID times, is to try and focus on areas that you can actually control. And really, that's you, your thoughts and your actions. And think about where you can truly influence You know, you can't end this barbaric conflict, but you can make that donation to a charity and perhaps offer a job or a contract to someone in or from Ukraine. You know, these conversations I've been having with founders has really shone a light on this area, focusing on what's really within your sphere of influence and what's outside it. Where is my time and energy best spent today to move this business or movement forward? And I believe successful founders are very good at this. They have almost a laser-like focus on what they can do by being clear on their purpose and their passion. Stephen Covey is the person to read on this, if this interests you, by the way. I regularly use some of his exercises when working with my clients. And so to today's fabulous episode. Last time I suggested you grab a cup of tea for our conversation with Craft Media. This time I'm going to recommend a lovely crisp glass of cider as I meet the co-founder of Scully Cider, Laura Clacy. Laura's journey to being a founder of a successful drinks brand is interesting in itself, but what really drew me to her story is that her co-founder, Carol, is not just her business partner, but also her life partner, her husband and father of their daughter. This episode really delves in into what it's like to create a business with your soulmate. And it's why we managed to run a business together now because there's no BS between us. It's brutal honesty at all times. We argue about the odd kind of difference of opinion, which is what you should do. It's healthy to to debate things, but we always know it's done with kind of love and respect and understanding at, at the base of it. This episode introduces a completely new dynamic to the founder's story and Laura is highly generous in sharing her insights into how a relationship forged in love makes complete sense in the world of business and that particularly challenging area, that of creating a startup. And by the way, in developing a cider brand, they chose one of the hardest sectors for startups to be successful in. It's also worth mentioning they've built a brand in the right way, as they are a proud B Corp business, and we talk about that towards the end of the episode as a way of celebrating B Corp month in March this year. In this episode, you'll hear what is crucial for finding your way together as life and business partners. Brutal honesty, long-term planning, understanding each other's skills and strengths, and how to build a really formidable level of resilience when things don't go to plan. And guess what? There are plenty of bumps in the road for the Scully founders. This was a wonderful chat with a really buoyant founder who understands why she and her husband have been successful I really enjoyed the conversation and I'm sure you will too, whether you're thinking about starting up with your partner or going solo. It's jam-packed as ever with support and insight. Please do remember to help more people have a chance to discover the Mojo podcast by completing the holy trilogy for podcasters. Please do leave a rating, write a short review on Apple Podcasts and please do share the link to the episode on your social channels. So, cider in hand, Let's go and meet Laura Clacy from Scully Cider. So welcome back to the Mojo podcast. And I'm delighted this week to be joined by Laura Clacy, who's in London and is the co-founder of Scully Cider. Laura, how are you doing? And did I pronounce Scully correctly? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, thank you so much for having me. You pronounce Scully perfectly. You won't believe how many times people get that wrong, which is not really surprising given how it's spelled. (laughs) And we'll we'll get into that, the origin of this fantastic name as we get into the podcast. And a little admission to the listeners, I did practice with Laura for about five minutes before we started, just I got Scully correct. I'll probably get it wrong at some point, but that's that's, that's just me. And lovely, lovely to have you. And and Laura, I always start here. I want to get a sense of where you are today. How is your mojo today out of 10? My mojo, very, very good question. Well, I'm actually battling one of the worst colds I've had since COVID. Um, So Mojo is probably slightly lower than normal, but given the beautiful weather we have outside today uh, and the blossoms and the sun shining and cider season starting, it's kind of counteracting it. So I'd say it's sort of like three quarters full. (laughs) Okay, you're giving me a a, a fullness of bottle 
verses <laughs> out of 10, but I accept that. You're, that's the business that you're in. <laughs> and I, and I 300 love that. Mils. <laughs> 300 mils. 300 mils, <laughs> to be precise. Um, and I, I love that sense that yours is, and we're going to get on to what Mojo means to you in a second, but this sense that there's this, what's going on immediately for you physically and, you know, not feeling great, but um, external environment having an impact on that. And wider things such as, as you say, you're in the, the side of business and it's apple season. So it's obviously a, key, a really key time right now. It is, it is. It's, it's um, summer, summer for us is kind of the, the key sales um, time for, for cider. And our whole business ethos is based on apples grown in the sunshine. Um, so the more sunshine, the better for us all around. It just makes perfect sense. Did you want me to hop in and, and answer what Mojo means to me? I would love you to tell me. Yeah, exactly. That's the, that you preempted my next question. Yes. Fine. Um, so for me, Mojo is, I guess, where I get my energy from. What what drives me, what what makes me get up in the morning and, and kind of conquer all the challenges and, and difficulties that come in a day, what inspires me to carry on. And I think what gives me my mojo is honestly my my husband and business partner, Carol. Um, he is the eternal optimist that even when I'm feeling slightly down and low and think the world is going to fall down on my shoulders, um, he thinks nothing's ever actually a problem. Um, so his eternal energy is my kind of inner source of, of, of energy and mojo and, and what gets me up and, and going. Um, he's also my kind of compass for when I'm veering off the, into the wrong direction and, and losing my, my mojo be it um, work ethic or um, or emotional kind of stability <clears throat> he's always there to kind of back things up oh brilliant and 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 you know p- part of why one of the reasons why we're talking is that I wanted to talk to someone who is not just in partnership with somebody else um, as a founder because this series is all about talking to the founders uh, and I've spoken to several founding duos so far but this mm-hmm. is the first time I've spoken to a founding duo who are also life partners. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is a, this is this added element of, of 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 obviously Carol and you and your journey, which we're going to talk about, and how you when you came together and, and when Zolly was was uh, Scully. Scully. <laughs> there you go. Did it, Scully? <laughs> was 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 birthed, um, and and what's what's happened since then? But um, you know, I, I thought it very interesting that you know that. Um, you have your own sort of intrinsic mojo, but you also got someone very close to you who kind of fills that mojo cup for you as well. Yep, absolutely. And and he has, you know, from maybe I'll sort of backtrack into, into how we met and it's a bit of a personal story, but I guess it kind of gives context into, into why he is such a strong, I guess so some of the definitions for mojo is like a talisman or a, um, a lucky charm. Um, and the the way I met Carol was in the most unlikely and extreme circumstances one could imagine. So he had decided to take a gap year and was traveling around the world wanting to set up a business. Um, he finished, he was a chartered accountant, did his five, four or five years at PwC and hated it and, and wanted to start a business. So he decided to go traveling around the world and kind of, I think he did, he was on country number nine by the time he got to South Africa. Um, and I, um, at the time, was was working at KPMG, and I went up with a bunch of friends that night, and um, I was with a sort of boyfriend at the time, and, and things didn't work out but it, between us, and it happened just as we got into the car, and Johannesburg is, is not the type of place where you can just grab a cab or get public transport. When you're in someone's car, you're then stuck. So I landed up at this party not wanting to be there at all, um, and I was with this guy's friends, and I all I wanted to do was get the hell out of there but I was stuck uh, and so I was standing at the bar and this English man walked up to me and started talking to me uh, and we just instantaneously clicked and it turns out Carol had gone to watch the rugby on his own at a pub and met a bunch of South Africans we are all very very friendly people in South Africa so they decided to drag this Englishman around and show him the sights of Joburg and so we met on the rooftop of it was someone's birthday party that they turned into a bar on top of an abandoned building it was 13 stories up and it was all lit with candles and there was no electricity. And it, I mean, it was dangerous as hell. I don't know why I even went there. I don't know how <laughs> he landed up there. So that's where we met. 
Um, he was then flying to, uh, made to be flying to Cape Town the next day. And at the end of the night, he begged me to go to Cape Town with him. And I was like, no, I've just met you. There's no ways I can just go to Cape Town with you. Um, and he's like, okay, fine. He'll cancel his, his flight and he'll leave the next day instead if I promise to see him the next day. So um, we then kind of swapped numbers and he didn't want to believe that I'd actually given him my uh, the correct phone number. So he <laughs> asked me for my business card to prove that my number was actually correct. Um, and we went in, on a date the next day and it was amazing. And he then traveled on for, um, for six weeks. I thought we would lose contact. And weirdly enough, we never did. So he went on to Australia, spent a year there, and we kept meeting up in random places throughout the world. I think having spent a year long distance in, in the initial phase of our relationship meant that we had to be um, ultra communicative and, and learn to communicate through, through words rather than just hanging out together or getting to know each other's friends or things like that. It was just him and I in this relationship with nobody else feeding in like your friend saying, oh, I don't really like him or your parents saying, I've got a reservation about this guy or seeing someone's face drop mm. when they, when he says something we had, we had to make up our own decisions as to how we felt about each other and learn to communicate about our needs and, and what we wanted from life uh, with each other outside of the, the kind of traditional um, relationship building phases. And I think that's how we became, that's how we got to know each other so intimately and so um, I guess we got to know each other's base souls. Um, and it's why we managed to run a business together now because there's no BS between us. It, it's brutal honesty at all times, which is why we, as, a, as a founding partnership, we don't really, we, we argue about the odd kind of difference of opinion, which is what you should do. It's healthy to, to debate things, but we always know it's done with kind of love and respect and understanding at, at the base of it. <clears throat> And so there's never really um, those conflicts with unsaid things that that found founding partners often have with each other, where they're too polite to say the thing they really want to say. We kind of just blurt it out and, and say it, mm. which is quite shocking to people at times. <laughs> but it works. <laughs> this, this, as I said, this brutal honesty that, you know, works for both of you and therefore for the business. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Sorry, that was quite a long winded story. No, but here no, we are. But- no, exactly. But exactly, <laughs> goes to exactly here you are. But and the thing that's, that's I suppose coming for me, and you, you have this, the, you know, the, the way your relationship started, and obviously the long distance and lots of traveling. When was it you decided not obviously just to be life partners, but to become business partners? To say that you know we can, I don't know, uh, we've, there's there's more to us than I say simply <laughs> life yeah. partners. There's, a, there's enough in that <laughs> anyway, isn't there? But then to add more to it, some may say more complication more yeah. challenge to a relationship is to add in being a business partner when when, when was that discussed or, or decided many different parts to that story I guess um, let me see if I can remember most of them <laughs> um, or, or the important bits at least um, one Carol set up a business in Australia so I moved we, we eventually decided that the place to start our relationship would be in Australia he wanted to start to set up a business there I was in a position where the company was going to let me move to wherever I wanted to go next. And so I just did a simple transfer with work Mm. and he was setting up his business and it was going well, but I found that he had a different business partner at the time and and they were not getting along particularly well. And he was bouncing all his ideas off me. And I felt like I was working for two businesses at the same time, both you know, for his other business and my own job. And I was like, your job sounds like so much more fun than than my job. Um, And he was relying on me more and more for for input and and guidance. So the kind of decision that that we wanted to work together was more out of, well, on, on some level, frustration from my side that I could have all these opinions, but they didn't matter because it wasn't my job to have an opinion or wasn't my, I didn't have the ability to, to execute ideas or, or for my opinion to be heard in that business. Mm. Um, so it was that was, was kind of one of the, the reasons. Then the other was that we, we sat down, we knew we were in Australia. It's really far away from both our families. I think it's 24 hours for his family to fly to Australia. Mine was 14 hours and super expensive to get to us. And so we knew we couldn't stay in Australia forever. And um, we did this enormous mind mapping process where we bought big pieces of paper one day um, and we kind of decided what did we want out of our lives? 
Um, oh, wow. and it sounds very cheesy, but we, we actually did it. We, we destroyed a whole wall. Um, and we kind of spoke about everything uh, from, you know, how much money do we want to have as a, as a couple? You know, do we want to, I remember the example we gave was, do we want to own the yacht or rent the yacht? Um, but we knew a yacht was involved. <laughs> <laughs> Entry level was a yacht, <laughs> it's whether it's yacht. owned or, or borrowed. Okay, I get it, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, and, you know, what type of climate did we want to live in? I mean, we failed at that epically. We live in London. But um, we always decided we want to live near the beach, near the ocean. It was important to both of us. We wanted to be in a city, not in suburbia. Um, we wanted to be kind of places where there are restaurants and theatre. And that's the thing. We decided how many kids we wanted to have. We decided, you know, all, all these different things that, as well as what type of a mum would I be if we had kids? Would I be working? Did I want to, you know, wow. be a stay-at-home mum? Uh, what would his role be? So, I mean, sorry, I'm going to love you. It, it was, we did a whole mind mapping exercise and yeah. decided, you know, I've, I've never wanted to be a stay-at-home mum. I always wanted to have a career. I've always wanted to have control over my own destiny. Um, and so running my own business was always something I, I had wanted to do. And so we decided, well, we're making this move out of Australia. South Africa seemed like the perfect place to move to because, or Cape Town, because it's got the beach, um, it's sunny, it's near both our families, ish near both our families. Um, and it, it just sounded, and, and we can both get there, we can both speak the language, it, it all just made sense. Um, but Cal wouldn't be allowed to work in South Africa. Being British in South Africa, it, it's very hard to get work permits. Right. So we decided that his only option was to start his own business again. And I kind of figured I didn't want to go back into sustainability consulting. I'd rather start a sustainable business myself. Uh, and so that was the whole kind of jumping off point for, for what we're going to do and, and how we're going to do it together. Wow. Yeah. And I'm just, and I'm, I'm thank you for talking about the mind mapping exercise, because I mean, that's something, well, I do it occasionally with some clients, but as a couple to actually <laughs> sit down and do that and, and plan it out. And as you say, you're, you're talking not, you know, the next six months, this is a, almost a lifetime that you were Absolutely. you mapped out. And, and what, a, what a process to go through as a, as a couple to make some amazing decisions by the sounds of it. And I'd highly recommend it to any couple, whether you're married for ages or, or just starting out, because often you'd find that it's re you, you, you having points of differences with each other. And often everything else is aligned, just that one thing. But if you can figure out what that one thing is where you're on polar opposite sides of the coin, it's much easier to kind of find a, a solution. I don't know, it's just, I've lost the, the mind map itself and chucked the papers in the gazillions of moves we've done over the last few years. But the, the principles of it have kind of stuck with us. Mm. Um, just FYI, we don't want to buy the yacht. We're quite happy to rent the yacht. <laughs> so that's where you netted out on, yeah. on, the, on the yacht piece, yeah. Yeah, that's really yeah. nice our piece. But but all the principles of, of how we want to live our life have stuck. And even though we know we're, we're living in London, know we're near the beach, we know that that's one day something that needs to come back to you. And we keep talking about how we get back to that point. So it kind of keeps us on track. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and sort of coming back to being, you know, uh, co-founders of a business. Uh, and so you, you knew you wanted to start a business together. Did you know it was Scully at that time or it was it's it's something around this kind of area is it in the drinks business so that was all part of the discussion as well so yes we didn't know it was going to be scrolly we weren't sure it was going to be cider although carol had started a cider business in australia um and but we kind of went through all the options because the other solution or the other kind of business idea we had at the time was um i'd been working in sustainability consulting for for many years and I had a lot of good contacts that I could have potentially started a sustainability consultancy um Cal being a chartered accountant we could have you know we, we had an idea around that sort of space mm. um and then we were both like well who doesn't want to be in a pub and call it work or would I rather be in <laughs> someone's boardroom writing policy documents and kind of doing audits of their processes and systems I was like oh I think being in a pub sounds like a better better option. Um, and then, uh, you know, one of our one of the the kind of founding thoughts as well was that um, being in, in sustainability and, and it was more I was in um, social impact creation at the time, working with the Australian federal government with small businesses to try and turn them 
into social enterprises or, or profitable businesses that gave back to their communities. And that really inspired me and, and being South African and seeing all the poverty that exists there and the, and the social challenges, I wanted this business to have a positive social impact on, on the people around us. So mm. cider seemed like a better option because it's got a bigger supply chain. They are actual, you know, you can work with agricultural with um, suppliers at the, at the very sort of lowest level, the farmers themselves yeah. to have an impact. So that, that had a big say in, in how and, and what we decided to, to set mm. up in the end. So mm. apples grown in the sunshine was the answer. <laughs> well, I, lo I love it. And, and, and can you take me back to that when you knew it was apples grown in the sunshine, this is, this is going to be it. What was, what was going on for both of you? What was, what made it happen? I suppose, because often, you know, Lots of people can come up with lots of ideas, but it sounds like both of you are real, you know, doers and yeah. ideas people by the, by the sounds of it. <laughs> was was it one of you kind of leading a little bit in that regard? Is one of you the risk taker and the other one a bit more risk averse? How does that work as a, as a life partnership? Um, very good question. I think we're both definitely risk takers. Um, my mum my mom has a saying, she keeps saying, Dora, you're on a roll which means that I'm just kind of, well, I mean, it goes, I, I'm, I'm sort of on an unstoppable path <laughs> down a hill. Um, so we're both definitely risk takers, but I'd say Carol is by far the more, um, he, he's the risk taker for sure, out of the, both, out of the two of us. I'm, mm. I'm a bit more cautious and, and think through outcomes. And it's still today, he sort of comes up with the, the, the broad, he'll make these sweeping statements like 10 million turnover in three years time. Um, and then I need to go and figure out how that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is is it? Yeah, so there are different roles going on then in the in the partnership. Would you say exactly? Yes, mm. definitely. Um, but he's the more commercial one who can see uh, he can see the end goal, but he can't see the steps on on how to get there. So he can see that it's plausible, uh, but sometimes he um, yeah he he needs he needs me to kind of fill in the gaps to make sure that that there's steps to to get to the end um but I'm never afraid to to, to take the leap and and yeah jump at the same time <laughs> mm -hmm. and is it do, do you think this be, being um life partners gives you this I because I I you know earlier on when I was talking about this I, I talked about the you know is it challenging actually being life partners in a in a business relationship but do you think it gives you more gives you an edge over you know competitors for example I mean, obviously, I'd say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know any other any other solution, um, but I do think it gives us a big edge on on our competitors or, or against other co-founding partnerships. I mean, mm. I mentioned it, mentioned it at the beginning, but that brutal honesty that that we have with each other um, and clear direction for for where we want our life to go. Because at the end of the day, we know we're doing this for what we've got investors now too, which is great. But um, at the end of the day, we're doing this for ourselves and our end goal for where we want to land up in life in 10, 15, 20 years time is the same thing. And so the business has sort of just become, and, and I've always wanted this to be my life. I've said it from the beginning. I, I want to love what I'm doing and I want work to be life and life to be work. I don't want to resent sending an email on a Saturday afternoon if something urgent has happened. Right. But I also don't want to feel like, oh, I haven't worked my eight hours today because you know my daughter's sick and, and has to come home. I don't want that kind of work. I, I am one of those people who feels massive kind of guilt if I'm not doing what I feel I should be doing. Um, so kind of having that mastery of our, of our own destiny, but knowing that he doesn't judge me for taking on a motherly role at a certain time because our daughter's sick, because he knows that somebody needs to do it. And if it's not me, who um mm. and the other one is kind of balancing priorities i guess in a in a traditional relationship a lot of my friends would tell me that their friends uh, that their husbands you know their job takes priority over their job and, and they mm. left doing everything in the house or um or vice versa whereas with us it's it's we can decide whose job is more important in that moment in time um and there's no hard feelings then if the other one's picking up the slack at home or picking up the slack at work and working till three o'clock in the morning and um, th there's no hard feelings that one's that, that the balance of power is it's quite equal in our in our situation and um, mm. so whether it's life or work work or life it's, it's all just one big lump of um 
one big lump that we love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what's coming to me is is that sort of term work life blend versus yes. balance because I think nice. often we get a bit fixated with trying to find a balance and that's when things like the guilt can kick in because oh, I'm out of balance and I'm not doing enough work I'm yeah. doing too much work but what it sounds to me like you've both agreed because you've got this life plan that involves the business yeah. that this is this is the blend and this is this works exactly or else it's we're making it work yeah it's a blend I, li I like that I had never kind of I think I'm going to coin that term now work-life blend I, I think it's a much better word <laughs> I've definitely borrowed it from somewhere someone uh <laughs> very yes, smart no. wrote that down but um yeah I, that's what just what came to mind for me that 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 to be a couple in business that you you're going to need that um because I imagine uh, and I'd love to talk about you know obviously we're going to talk about the successes but also to get real a bit and what's been the what would have been the hardest challenges along the Scully's kind of life cycle from from launch to establishing itself as it is now in you know loads of wonderful supermarkets where you can pick it up in the in the UK? What what have been some of those kind of hard bumps in the road? Oh gosh, many along the way. Um, I guess it was starting the very first bump was as soon as we decided to start the business um, and we're still living in Australia. I resigned from my job and they then offered me um, a directorship level, which would have been an enormous salary um, and it would have been great and wonderful. So that, there was that kind of challenge oh. of, is this now the right time yeah. or should I stick to my career for a bit longer before making this leap? Um, that, I mean, that was just kind of a, a well, that was a challenge. Mm. I then decided to take the plunge and do the business. And a week later, I found out I was pregnant. <laughs> that put a massive spanner in the work, works because suddenly I'd left this job, we'd um, sold all our furniture, we'd bought our flights, we're getting married in a week and everything's now being put into, I mean, who knew what was going to happen? <laughs> so um, that was sort of challenge number two, finding out I was pregnant. Uh, and do we still run this business or how is this all going to work? Um, and then... I guess the next big challenge was we got to South Africa and thought, you know, we're both doers, we can hustle, we are, we're, um, we, we're invisible, we can do anything. We're in our 20s as well, so we think we can do absolutely anything. Uh, but South Africa is filled with a lot of red tape. And right. so it actually landed up taking us 18 months to legally be able to sell a bottle of cider because, I don't know, they lost our application forms, they went missing another time. Um, then we got pushed to the bottom of the pile because they didn't have a piece of paper. All the while, we had to rent a winery and equipment and hire a cider maker. And we had to basically set up the whole business and then wait to get a liquor license. Oh, so wow. that, along with access to capital in South Africa, is, is, very, um, is very challenging. So, you know, we really went down to the bare bones of our finances while, while in South Africa. Um, mm. and, and that was hard. You know, we both well-trained well-educated people all our friends are succeeding and, and earning loads of money and going on fancy holidays here we are kind of uh, with this tiny little business and everyone's sort of judging us thinking we're mum and pop on the side um which is not what we are so so what got you th through that so I imagine by now has your daughter been born at this point when things are yes. really tight so the so new brand new baby yeah. uh, uh you're both in South Africa where the red tapes like tying you up literally yeah um you've got money going out because we're not we are talking about a um a, a capital intensive business mm -hmm. i suppose you need yeah. you need the, the apples quite literally and yep. do things with them um and there's not much there's no money coming in oh, what yep. kept you going what kept the belief at that point i mean again that's like i started carol the eternal optimist he just never ever lost faith that things would be okay and that we'd turn it around and I don't know, I, I don't know if you, I, maybe everyone has it, but I feel like even when really bad things happen, something good always happens at the same time. And likewise, when really good things happen, that same day, something really bad will happen. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> but there was always enough mm. just to keep us hooked in. Um, so we very quickly got waiters in the UK when we, um, when we launched in South Africa. So that was a huge win for us. Um, uh, people just love the flavor of our product. So, I mean, Carol's belief has always been, 
our product tastes better than anything else on the market and we're doing something totally different to anybody else in the market, it will work. And he just never, even when I, even when my, um, uh, my faith is, um, is, is challenged, he, he doesn't lose faith ever. He just believes he's got the answer and he's right. Mm. And he was. In any business's life cycle, there are going to be these bumps in the road. And he said, you've had many. Uh, mm -hmm. But that talking about that particular one was a pretty major one of time. And to know you can yeah. come over that. And as, as a couple, have that belief. And as you say, okay, Carol might be the, the over-indexing on the optimism, uh, <laughs> but how useful that is. But also you noticing, I, I, I was thinking about there, you, you said, oh, you know, good things happening, bad things happening. I think it takes a lot to notice sometimes there are good things. I, there is that sense we can get into a, oh, what's going on? Is, is it me? This isn't going to work. And it becomes a bit of a cycle, a downward cycle. And if you look at the, you know, take a bit of a lesson from positive psychology and go, actually, it's, it's temporary. It's not just me. This yeah. isn't going to last forever. Uh, and start to, yeah. that gives you the ability to notice great news. Great news is coming on the, on the horizon. So you're so right. And you need to keep looking for those silver linings because they, as you said, at times they are, they are harder to find, but you'd be surprised how many opportunities arise from, from things that go wrong. Um, the, mm. the, the number of times, you know, our, our decision to move to the UK for one was, you know, South Africa was going into a financial recession and we saw the writing on the wall. A lot of the pubs and restaurants around us were shutting down and really struggling. Um, and at that moment in time, our um, importer here to the UK said, look, he's not sure if he can carry on importing school into the UK. He wants to move on to other things, which in the one context, you could have looked at it as, oh, my God, everything's going wrong. But on the flip side, we we're like, oh, well, actually, this is an opportunity to move the business to the UK and take over and own and own the rights to our, our brand and our business in the UK. So that's what I mean by the kind of good things and bad things happening at the at the same time. Um, but yes, you're right. It, it, it is about I don't know, having the blind faith to, <laughs> to believe that that's a good thing. <laughs> well, I have I have had actually a few other founders of uh, and one particular um ben branson who founded seedlip he used the term oh, yeah. del delusional he said <laughs> i had to be delusional for people to believe that non-alcoholic spirits could be a thing um and i'd, I'd love because you know you, i think when we talked before you talked about you know another reason why cider was a an interesting area for you is because you know that there, there wasn't really much going on obviously cider was a category unlike mm -hmm. seedlip where there was no category but you saw something in a category that was a little bit old hat, if that's fair to say. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think um, my dad always says, you've either got to, um, my dad runs his own, or ran his own business too. He said, you've either got to do what everyone else is doing, but do it better, or you've got to do something that nobody else is doing. So I kind of took that quite literally and thought we'll do them both. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> right. uh, cider is a, an existing category and it's huge. I think it's worth 3.6 billion um, pounds a year in the UK alone. Um, it, so it, it's a significant category, but it's one that most people don't really think of. Uh, you know, me for one, if, if I'm going to go out and, and drink cider, be my go-to choice even today I mean I'll drink scully until the cars come home but I would much rather pick up a glass of wine or a gin and tonic or a beer cider is just not one that really kind of floats my boat and the same applies to many people who are pre who are drinking premium drinks when when we're looking what, what to do we identified that as a, as a huge opportunity nobody had thought to premiumize the cider category and and make it more wine-like or make the branding look stronger. You know, if you walk down the aisle, um, they're all very tractor clad, um, kind of <laughs> pictures of apples. I mean, they are apples, but they're, they're very kind of from the 1970s or 1800s. That's kind of the, the era where cider brands were born. Right. Um, and there aren't many people playing in this sort of modern cider and thinking, what does a modern consumer want in their drinks? They want you know, things to be natural, much like I'm sure um, Seedlip told you, but people want sort of um, natural produce that's that's made in in a quality style where you understand the supply chain, where we know that it's mm. made ethically. Um, that was kind of the inspiration behind, uh, behind Squally. So 
we're taking what everyone has done and, and trying to make it better. <laughs> but we're also doing what no one has done before in that nobody is using apples grown in the sunshine. They're all using cider apples, which are incredibly tannic. If you bit into that thing, it, you'd spit it straight out. Yeah. So um, our apples are the, are the apples you buy in the supermarket every day, the, the golden delicious Granny Smith apples. They taste good. We don't need to do anything to them to make them taste good. Um, yeah. So the other side is add sugar and concentrate and flavorings and colorings and things to make it taste palatable. We don't, we literally don't need to do anything to it. So kind of took a bit of both of dad's advice. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and thanks for coming back to that. Cause I just think what great advice from your father, and that, to, you know, do, do what everyone's doing, but better. So it's recognized, but also what no one's doing. Yeah. Um, and that, and that what an ama- amazing advice. And and on that, on, on your dad being a, an entrepreneur, I think you mentioned, did, do you think that's helped you as well? Not just the advice now, but the, the, the attitude, the approach to risk taking of, you know, that moment when you left your, your big job, your big corporate job uh, and stepped out. Do you think that helped? Definitely in so many ways. So dad wouldn't consider himself to be an entrepreneur. He um, set up a law firm. Um, so I don't know why, but he, he would never call himself an entrepreneur, um, mm. but he is. Uh, and I think growing up and seeing how hard he worked for it and really resenting him as a kid for him never being at home and always prioritizing work over, over us and corporate entertainment. And, you know, I'm, I always used to think, you just go into the rugby dad, like, don't, don't call that work. But actually now I see that he he did what he needed to do for for our family and, and gave mm. us huge opportunities that we wouldn't have had had he not done that and and mm. seeing I mean at a base level seeing how much more money you can earn if you do it for yourself as opposed to being getting a salary and seeing the the self determination in it so he could decide um, how big or how small his business would be I mean obviously the other factors at play but if you work in, in employment, you, you don't get that choice. You just get told to do a job and, and you have to kind of carry on with it. So um, I, I learned a lot from him in terms of what work ethic actually means. Um, mm. I've learned to to apologize to him now for giving a, giving him a hard time <laughs> growing up. <laughs> I'm doing exactly the same thing. Um, but yeah, it's it's helped a lot in that way. And, and he's a great sounding board. For, I mean, both our dads or both, all our parents are great sounding boards. Um, but he's a great one for kind of how to deal with with challenges from kind of staff problems through to um, sort of feeling overwhelmed and, and how he deals with those sorts of problems. So, yeah, definitely. I mean, he's always got nuggets of, of great advice. I mean, the other one you spoke about having um, confidence and, and risk taking. Um, he's always said to me, do something every single day that scares you. When I do kind of feel my heart palpitating because I have to send a really awkward, horrible email um, or walk into a bar on my own with a bottle of squally and be like, hey, do you want to try my new cider? And I kind of remind myself that, okay, I'm doing the thing today that scares me. This is my thing. I can take it off, <laughs> off yeah. the list. And it kind of gives you that confidence to just not give a damn. But yeah, that idea of pushing yourself every single day, there's going to be something really yeah. uncomfortable, scary, fear-filled. And if I can conquer that, almost like then I can get to the next day and there'll be something else. And yeah. So there's something in that that because I'm hearing a lot of resilience from both of you as as founders, uh, and maybe some Thanks. of that just well, you know, the lot lots of things have happened along the way, and and we, as yeah. you say, will happen in the future. But you know, each day we're just conquering something, either yeah. something that we've you've personally created as a as a barrier because we all do that, or something that's yeah. been put in front of you, like the red tape in South Africa. So yeah, wonderful, wonderful nuggets. I think you have to be resilient. Otherwise, it is quite easy to give up um, at times. But you've also got to have um, the other thing that that helped, I guess, get us to where we are is not having a fallback plan. <laughs> um, oh, oh, yeah. Tell me about this. So, well, I mean, we used all our money on this business. We, we pumped everything <laughs> right. we had. Into it. So, and and in South Africa, you know, Cal couldn't get a job. So, if the business failed, he'd be unemployed. And I'd have to go back to consulting, which to me at the time seemed like um, like a punishment and torture. So th- mm. there wasn't a plan B. And now we're kind of in a position where I kind of think we've made ourselves unemployable. Um, <laughs> so, right. <laughs> it can't fail. <laughs> we have to make this work because this is the path we've chosen and all our money's gone into it. And um, uh I mean, now given turnover, the amount we put in is 
is much smaller. But I mean, there was a time where, you know, we would have seemed like absolute losers of society if, if it did fail. So it was it was that thing of not not having the option to fail. Well, and so, yeah, I don't regret not getting investors earlier because it did it did spur us on, I think. Right. And, and, and you're getting to that investor thing is is, is is interesting and probably useful for people listening to. But I, I love this idea of you creating the consequence, either deliberately or not, that there is nowhere else to go here. So we have it has to work. Yeah. It has to work, which gives that probably it's that I don't know on a morning when you're feeling a bit like, oh, really, do I have to make that call? I've, I've absolutely got to do it. I've got, got to. to do it. It's my mm. livelihood at stake. <laughs> And now it's now it's lots of people's livelihoods at stake. Right. Okay. So you you, know, you employ people, right? The, yeah. the more consequence. Yeah. Um, Ten of us. Right. Mm. As, so as, as Scully has grown, you've got people who are on the payroll, and I've you know I've spoken to other founders who say when they started off, that was one of the hardest things. It wasn't so much about them, but it was this idea that they were responsible for other people's mortgages, that this thing worked. <laughs> so scary being responsible mm. for other people not scary but yes it's, it's that thing that scares me every day because <laughs> mm. I'm, I'm 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 the decisions i make as a business and, and strategy of going forward um is is what matters to other people's lives and livelihoods depend on it too so you really have to think about the decisions you're making to make sure mm. as long as you believe that it's the right one um it normally is Mm. well and, and I was going to ask about so you know, again as a, as a founding couple work-life blend we talked about I imagine you're talking about the business all the time there are no boundaries between yep. you know work and life and so how easy was it for both of you to bring other people in to help either uh as a full-time employees or as consultants to advise you when you've you've birthed this brand this business how easy was it to say hey we don't have the answers come and come and help us I think we're opposite to other founders for me it was the biggest relief in the <laughs> world having people join us other than the stress of, of them being being responsible for their livelihoods mm. but um you know neither of us come from an alcohol background we've just winged it all the way through to to where we are um then when you start to hire amazing talent who come with actual experience in what you're trying to do and can then unravel some of the mistakes you've made and kind of fix problems along the way or come up with ideas, it's it's just unbelievable to see and, and how everything blossoms. So I definitely get my energy from, from other people. Um, and so the more people we have, the more energy I I, I feed off their, off their energy um, and experience and, and knowledge mm. and we've been really lucky that we've got a great team and we've learned so much from the team but I think my advice to other founders is get the right people um, mm. that, that are both a cultural fit and and have the right skills and experience but I've loved it I mean getting people on board for me was something we always wanted um, and the minute we did it I, I didn't have any of those other issues that founders have of kind of like it's my turf don't tell me how to do this business it's my baby um, it is my baby but I'm very happy for people with more experience than me uh, to tell me how to run it um so that's great consultants on the other hand i i don't like working with consultants um it, but i think that's just personal preference i prefer it to be my own people i believe in um i believe in human capital and them having a vested interest in right. in, in a good outcome and i feel like consultants often don't share at the end of the day they're going to get their paycheck anyway because you've signed a contract and so you don't always get um you don't get that passion and, and fear of failure <laughs> from mm. them, I guess. Um, so, so that's why I prefer to to have a bigger team uh, and do it ourselves and, and put our own um, to put our own backsides on the line and mm. and be accountable for them at the end of the day. You did mention investors briefly, and and you obviously took a while for <clears throat> you to bring investors in. Just briefly, what was it like? You know, the decision to say, right, we are going to effectively sell some of the the business to some people. Yeah. How, how was that in terms of that sort of letting go or, or was it just so necessary? It was like, it's not, it's not even a decision. We need, we need more capital. We, we keep saying these mantras to ourselves to the point where it's just part of everyday conversation, but we've always said we'd rather be a small part of something big than a big part of something small. Yeah. Um, and so we always wanted investors, but South Africa, um, the opportunity to raise capital for a startup are, um, are almost non-existent. 
uh, to the point where they all wanted to see profitability within 12 months. Um, they wanted to see their cash return to them within three years. And, you know, startups don't in, in food and beverage don't, don't work that way. Mm. So it's very hard to persuade investors in South Africa to believe in us as a, as a, as a concept. Um, so we had to create that minimum viable product to kind of get going and, and prove that we could do it. We also had no background in the sector, so we couldn't just grab the attention of the right people. Um, so we, and then South Africa's got all sorts of other challenges with um, black economic empowerment. So we couldn't get government funding. The banks don't have funding for startups. Um, so it was only really when we moved to the UK and we started looking for investment here, it's chalk and cheese. I mean, people here are so open to, to startups. Um, I, I think, in South Africa, startups are kind of viewed as like, oh, shame, those poor little startups. In the oh, UK, hey. you're revered as, as these kind of <laughs> heroes who are brave enough to venture and do something for yourselves. Yeah. Um, so it's, it was very different coming here. And, and then the, the opportunities for funding just sort of started falling on our laps. So we always wanted to have investors, um, but we only started looking properly in the UK in 20. 19 um we did our first small race I think it was 19 maybe early 2020 yeah it was pre-covid I can't right. tell you exactly when pre-covid we did our first small race uh, and then we did one mid-covid um we've got loads of investors now and I've again I find them incredibly useful as a tool we've got some mm. great strategic investors who we can pick up the phone to at any point of time and and have a chat to them and their knowledge and insights because they're all old and rich. Um, <laughs> they've clearly done some things right in their lives and um, and they offer some real sound advice when needed. So I've, yeah, I've enjoyed having them on board as well. Oh, and one other thing I wanted to ask you about, we, we, you talked a little bit about it, but in terms of social impact, and I wanted to ask you about being a B Corp uh, yes. company, because I believe you got, did you get that last year? Uh, this year. This year, right. Well, okay, so we yeah. we applied last year in January. Right. It took a year to to get the certification. Because it's quite a process, right? You've got to prove a, an awful an awful lot of areas to the business. But with again, not to go into all the detail on it, but just mm -hmm. what, what does that mean to you as a business, as a brand, to be a B Corp? Yeah, as you're completely right, it's a big process, and B Corp take it from a much broader level than just environmentally friendly or whatever. And mm. um, you can be any business, but as long as you've got you're doing enough things to create both social envi and environmental impact and um, you, you can qualify to be a B Corp. Um, so for us, B Corp is, is kind of four pronged. Um, I'm checking if I can remember my four pronged. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the one, and I guess the most important one for me is um, trade, not aid. It's kind of the, the slogan we've given it. Um, so where we can is to trade with developing nations um, and instill training um, governance, provide them with op opportunities for, for, for upskilling themselves um, and, and providing genuine economic development in South Africa. Um, so that's one. Um, the other one is youth empowerment. So Cal and I very much believe from the beginning that having um, young people, we, we get our energy from people, but young people in particular have got a different connection to the world and, and you know, we've been in this business now for many years and, you know, the guys we start that we've always taken on, on grads um, and the ones we started with have now moved on to incredible roles at Google and, and all over the place. Um, so we've always tried to keep a certain level of our staff as young people that we can mm. train and develop and, and provide mentorship and, and advice and, um, and, and training. So, yeah, youth empowerment is, is another core one for us. Um, environmentally friendly, so not having an impact on the planet as much as we can. Um, again, it's partly why I chose apples as well, because they grow in a tree. It's a sustainable um, raw material to begin with, as opposed to beer, which is made from wheat, which is taken up the soil, um, uh, soil health, etc. cetera. Um, apples, you know, grow in the tree, fall off the tree, next year they grow again, it's great. Being natural, so right. not adding any rubbish to our product. So no added sugar, no concentrate, no water, yeah. Um, having having being better for you, I guess, is the is the kind of buzzword there. Here are four things that I suppose keep you really focused on on the way you want the business to be anyway. But it's 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 I mean, I guess it's helpful that it's recognised 
yep. as the, you know this is your when a consumer is making a choice i guess they can look at a b corp and a non-b corp and make their call for me b corp is so great because we do all these things but to try and explain in marketing that you know, at the end of the day and i started with this we have an amazing tasting cider that tastes better than the other ciders on the market that's the message I want to be telling people. Yeah. But then to try and say, oh, and on top of that, we're carbon neutral. I don't want to be known as the carbon neutral cider, but B Corp's great because it sort of wraps up. I don't need to tell people that we're doing all these amazing things. The label's there to say, yep, confirmed you are an ethical producer um, of a product. And then we can carry on with our main messaging and our and kind of selling the, the product for what it is and not trying to hide behind. Um, you know, I, I find there are a lot of products out there that hide behind their sustainability credentials to mask other um potential challenges in their in their products themselves so mm. um i yeah i love b corp for that reason <laughs> right right and it is we, we are recording in march and it is b corp month, month i believe yes this march it and, is. And, I, it and is. I think i think this episode will come out in march as well so amazing uh, so congratulations to all the b corp organizations out there um Absolutely. laura I've, I've i've really enjoyed our chat i just want to finish on one one more question and it goes back to mojo because you talked about what it means for you and also where you get it from but on, on a kind of like a daily basis if you're feeling oh mojo's a little low today beyond obviously tapping into to carol who's a great um support for your mojo are there some things that you do some habits you have that kind of just help you know if i do this my best chance of having a good mojo day quite a few actually uh so and, and one i actually learned only in the last few weeks so maybe i'll start with that one um a very clever woman told me that so i always i know that meditate well, not meditating but for me breathing deeply definitely helps calm the nerves mm. um and i always kind of felt guilty that i never find time to to meditate and, and be mindful and, and think through things and she taught me that you can actually do it throughout the day. So she gave me some key moments and she, now I'm like taking all her IP here, but um, she kind of said when she boils the kettle, it's three minutes that she knows she has a kettle click and it's three minutes that she can be mindful. As she gets to the, her front door and puts her keys in the door, she takes three deep mindful breaths before she walks out the door and faces the world. And I've been trying to do that. And I mean, each person's, I mean, I don't, we don't have a kettle, so it's, it's not that, but like, turning on the microwave to warm up my daughter's milk, for example, I know that that's 30 seconds that I can then take a breath or when I get to the top of the stairs before I walk into my bedroom, I can take. So I find that like um, intermittent <laughs> intermittent meditation Isn't that, seems to yeah. be quite a good strategy. <laughs> I, lo I love that. And we'll, we'll try and find uh, the woman who sort of coined this. I, I can and, send you her name. Oh, She's please the, do. I don't I'll, know if it's hers, but she, I'll put it in the show notes, she told but... me. Yeah, but it's a, I think it's a great, you know, this is all about spreading ideas, this podcast. So, because people often say to me, you know, I, I meditate, I have to find 40 minutes a day to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and people find, oh, where'd you find the time? We just kind of get into routine and you do it. But if you can identify, as you say, that that three minutes to boil a kettle, what a great idea to just to take time to be present uh, and to be mindful, at least for then. I bet that adds up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you can easily rack up 40 minutes over a day yeah. of, of those moments when you are filling up your bottle of water at the office or yeah, walking up the stairs. And, and, and okay, the other one is obviously exercise, which yeah. I've been pretty crap at lately. But um, exercise is it definitely, I mean, anyone who's depressed should do exercise. It, it is, it definitely lightens the load and mm. opens your mind and allows you to breathe. I think anything breathing related. <laughs> Well, we t we, it's pretty important for us as humans. And uh, as I've had some breathwork uh, really? practitioners <laughs> on, they've said we, just, we, don't, we don't breathe properly. No. Most of us do not breathe properly. Um, I and certainly is, don't. And we can learn or relearn perhaps yeah. how, to, how to do it. Definitely. Fabulous. Well, <laughs> Laura, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for coming on to the Mojo podcast, sharing the story of Scully uh, and and particularly this this the story of of life partners who are co-founders oh no problem at all i hope i hope it was interesting and i answered your questions if, there, if there's anything else anybody wants to know is thinking up thinking about setting up a business with their um life partner i'm i'm always here to have a chat i i love hearing other people's stories as well so oh brilliant, um, brilliant. well we'll hopefully we'll open that up a bit on yeah when we, when we share the episode uh, people want to get in, in touch with you hopefully they they will wonderful lovely to see you and uh take care 
thank you so much. That was great. I really enjoyed that. What a fantastic and refreshing chat that was. Laura has such an infectious personality and really brought so much honesty to the conversation. So thank you so much, Laura. And what about that offer to support you? If you are looking to launch a business with your life partner, she certainly meant it, so do reach out to her. I also want to thank my friend Trisha Bacon for making this conversation happen. Trisha set up an organisation called Couplepreneurs as she recognised there was a need for support for life partners who were also business partners. There are loads of great resources and support out there uh, and I'll link to that website in the show notes. Where do I even start with takeouts from this one? Okay, uh, how about how Mojo is transferable from person to person as Laura recognised she knows Carol will fill her Mojo bottle up when it's running a bit empty. Mind mapping as an exercise, what a great tool to use whether you're in business or in a relationship with someone to plan where you wanna go in that relationship and or business. Looking for those silver linings every day when things maybe don't go to plan look for some good news because it is on its way and her dad's wonderful advice on how to position a business and also that idea of doing something every day that scares you i love that and i also think her dad should probably have his own podcast so i hope you loved that one as much as me please do go and tell a few people about it if you found it useful and remember to rate and review over on apple podcasts as this really does get the mojo podcast in front of more people Okay, until next time, I hope your mojo continues to flow.